are picking up our Bible study, a walk through the book of Romans. Last week we actually had gone through verse 26. I believe on the internet I said through verse 25. Uh, but as always, I'm going to do a little bit of a uh, overlap. Uh, verse 26 reads, For it hath pleased them of Macedonia and Achaia to make a certain contribution for the poor saints which are at Jerusalem. We were talking last week about the fact that Paul, who had never yet been to uh, Rome, was in the process of making arrangements to go to Rome. He said, when I travel to Spain, I plan to come your way, in verse 24. He said, when I go to Spain, I plan to come your way and visit with you and spend some time with you. In verse 25, he said, but right at the moment, I'm going to Jerusalem. In verse 26, he explains why he's going to Jerusalem in order to deliver an offering that had been taken uh, in some of the Gentile world in order to help support the poorer saints who were really struggling uh, in Jerusalem. So Paul said, I'm going to Jerusalem. I've got an offering I need to deliver there. And uh, after that, I will be traveling to Spain. When I make my trip to Spain, I'll be coming your way. Well, that was a quick and easy overlap, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. yeah. Amen. All right. <coughs> now, in verse 27 now, he said, It hath pleased them verily, and their debtors they are, for if the Gentiles have been made partakers of their spiritual things, their duty is also to minister unto them in carnal things. This is an extremely important principle. And I've got to tell you, in my experience, uh, in today's world anyway, this is one area where people are completely... Uh, they, they just don't even get it. Paul is saying the saints at Jerusalem and the saints in Israel overall have been instrumental, obviously, in bringing the gospel to the Gentile world. And he said, therefore, this is why the saints in the Gentile world are wanting to send an offering to these folks because they feel indebted to those folks. They feel as though they, they owe a debt to those who have helped to uh, make sure the gospel was able to reach them. We got people in the church world today, and it's not just our church, I, especially in affirming circles, I oftentimes I will hear from uh, people who are pastoring affirming churches around the country, and many, many times they will say to me, we cannot get people to support our work. We cannot get people to support our work. I know one lady that was uh, pastoring a church I forget where it was exactly off the top of my head. Um, and she was there about seven years. And finally, one day on Facebook, she announced, we're closing it down, we're shutting it down. And she's, you know, uh, I wrote her a note and I said, I'm so sorry, you know, Papa. She said, brother, we could not get people to support the work. So we just cannot get people to support the work. Everybody who is in affirming work that I know is paying their own way. And if, if the pastor isn't paying for the meeting space, and if the pastor isn't paying the bills, then they're not getting paid. And I know one man who's pastoring uh, over here in Indiana. They've got a nice little church building and all that, you know, so he can brag because he sure loves to brag. And I'm going to tell you, I know for a fact that the majority of that he's paid for himself. Mm -hmm. He and his partner have made very, very good livings. They make very good money. And they basically, you know, support this church for the most part themselves. Plus, they have a little uh, pizza place they operate. And they all operate it like one day a week or something to that effect. Mm -hmm. And But that helps raise money to support it as well. 
But you know, in our community, people do not understand the principle of what Paul is saying. You owe folks who have made the effort to bring this message to you. That is a spiritual principle. You know, there is a worldly carnal mentality that, well, bless God, if you want to bring it to me and I didn't ask for it, then I don't owe you nothing. Yeah. How many times have you heard people say that? Mm -hmm. Well, I didn't ask you for it. Mm -hmm. You just gave it to me. I didn't ask you for it. Oh, okay. So then that means that you are free of any obligation to yeah. support it or to give back because you didn't ask for it. Well, I'll tell you what, you didn't ask for it, but you sure were happy to take it. Mm -hmm. yeah. You may not have asked for it, but you yeah. sure were happy to take it. I'm gonna tell you something, if you weren't willing to support it, then you should have said thank you, but no. Mm -hmm. yeah. If you're not willing to support an affirming church in your community, then you shouldn't attend it. Because mm -hmm. you have no business benefiting spiritually from that ministry when you have no desire in the universe to support it. And that is what a lot of people in our community, not just in our community, but a lot of people in our world are doing. Now, it has been the case for eons. I, I can't even fathom how far back it might go, but it has been the case for many, 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 probably centuries, that the average church is supported and kept alive by no more than 20% of the congregants. Mm -hmm. wow. Now that's been a fact, at least in evangelical and fundamentalist. I've seen studies that have been done. And in the average church, if you have 100 people, 20% of them are tithe payers. 20%. And that is the budget that church has to work with. So when they build a new church building, guess what? The majority of the weight financially of building that building is on 20% of the congregation. That is, that's, that's just the way it works. That's the way it's done. You know, the Jehovah's have got it all figured out. They, they've really, I'll tell you what, they've got it. I wish people could realize it ain't nothing but an enormous uh, pyramid scheme is really what it is. It's a money-making scheme, and people just don't realize. But they've got it all worked out, Brother Richard. But bless God, if you're going to please Jehovah, you've got to go out and give out all this literature. Yeah. Well, guess who's got to buy the literature? You do. Well, guess what that means? That means in order to be saved, in effect, you've got to pay for it. Because you've got to buy this literature to give it out, to give it away. Now listen, when I was a kid, Jehovah's Witnesses came door to door selling it. They didn't give it away. They sold their literature. They didn't give it away. And the logic behind that, because see, I told you, I've been studying cults for many years, and I read uh, things that were written by people within the organization, and they said that at that time, the mentality of the uh, organization was, well, if people want the truth, bless God, they should be willing to pay for it. Well, what happened was, nobody wanted their stupid literature. And people were not willing to pay for it. So they took their captive audience, their own members, and they made it incumbent upon their own members to buy the literature to give away. Yeah. Now their logic changes. Now it is, if you love Jehovah and you love the truth, as they call it, then you should feel the burden to buy this literature because we can't just give it to you for free because it costs money to produce it. So you should feel obligated to buy this literature so you can give it out. Okay? Well, you're required by the Jehovah's Witnesses to go door to door witnessing a certain number of hours a week. Required. 
Let me tell you something, friend. Don't you ever make the mistake. I've heard people say this, and every time I hear it, I, I just cringe. Well, if our people just had dedication like the Jehovah's Witnesses, they don't have dedication. Those people are told that they're going to be destroyed in Armageddon if they don't go out and witness, what, four hours a week or... More than that. I mean, it, it, ridiculous. And, oh, yeah. And this is required of you. Not only is it re required of you, you have to submit a report to your local elders showing the time that you went out and the time that you finished and showing them that you have fulfilled your obligation according to the organization. Now, mind you, this requirement of going out witnessing is married to this notion that you should be buying literature to give out to these people that you're witnessing to. They're not giving you the literature for free to go out and witness with. No, 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 no. You got to pay for it if you're a good Jehovah. You say, well, Pastor, why are you telling us all this? I'm trying to tell you folks, listen. There are organizations out there know how to make the money, okay? They know how to squeeze the money out of people. God's church doesn't play those kind of games. God's church doesn't play those kind of games, all right? But it amazes me how people feel comfortable benefiting from someone else's money, someone else's effort, someone else's time, someone else's energy, and they feel no obligation whatsoever to give anything back. That is not a Christian mindset. No, it isn't. And this is what Paul is talking about in verse 27. He says the Gentile saints in Macedonia and elsewhere uh, have taken this offering in order to support the poor saints of Jerusalem because they feel indebted to them. If it wasn't for those poor saints supporting my missionary journeys and helping me to go out and preach the gospel where the gospel had never been preached before, these very people would never have heard this gospel. So they feel indebted to these folks. We got people watch us online every single week. Well, I didn't ask you to put videos online. Well, you know what? If you don't have any interest whatsoever in supporting this work, but you don't mind benefiting from it, then your mindset is not Christ-like. It is not a Christian no, mindset. No. Somewhere along the line, you ought to be thinking, well, bless their hearts, these folks are going through a lot of effort, they're doing a lot of work, they're doing a lot of expense in order to share their ministry with us. I ought to support them. I ought to help them. Why? Because I'm benefiting from what they've done. Right. This is what Paul's talking about in verse 27. Their duty, he said, their duty is also to minister unto them in carnal things. That... their duty. What is duty? That means it is your obligation associated with your position. See, it's not my duty to do what a soldier does because I'm not a soldier. When a soldier is working and he's on the clock, so to speak, what do they call it? He's on duty. He is doing what he's supposed to do as it is related to his position. When Brother Jack is working in security and he is on the clock, he is considered what? On duty. So he is to be doing during that time what is his duty to do. That's right. You follow what I'm saying? Now, as believers, 
it is our duty to support those yeah. who are less fortunate. It is our duty to support those who are struggling. It is our duty to support those who are doing the work of the ministry. Yeah. Okay. And it is our duty to pay back when we're able. Mm -hmm. Those who have paid it forward in order for us to be benefited. Amen. Yeah. That's what Paul said in verse number 27. And, you know, this is one reason why when we have ministers that come through our church, like Sean Thomas and all this, uh, I say for weeks and weeks and weeks ahead of time, we're a small church, okay? And I'm aware of that. And I know we have very limited resources, but this is why I will say over and over again, folks, please, if you can set $5 a week aside until Sean gets here, so that you have $20 or $30 to contribute toward the offering. Please do that. Because it is our duty. See, a lot of churches don't approach supporting ministries that come through their fellowship and are a blessing to them and a help. They don't view it as their duty to be a blessing to these people. I do. Tommy can tell you. He's known me almost... 14 years he'll tell you I take that duty very seriously I say well we've got so much money in the church account you know when Sean gets here whatever we take for a love offering I'm going to add whatever amount is necessary to bring it up to about 300 because I feel like that is the minimum we ought to give I feel like, now listen, I've had preachers invite me to come preach at their churches. And, I mean, we made arrangements months in advance. They could have easily, easily advised their folks, you know, hey, listen, let's try to set something aside. You know, done the same thing I did. But no, they don't. They don't take their duty seriously. I get there, I preach two services for them. Saturday and Sunday I stay in a church member's home I'm not asking to be kept in a hotel or a motel or anything you know I'm happy to stay in someone's home a lot of people are uncomfortable staying in someone's home I can't say I'm altogether you know <laughs> th uh, thrilled with it but I know that it makes things easier and less expensive for the church so I'm willing to do whatever I've got to do and if they put down a plate of rice and beans for me to eat I eat rice and beans and I'm happy to do so and you will not hear me complain about it but you know what I've gone and preached brother I've I went to one church they invited me to come preach them a revival I went down and preached them a revival and I preached three days and do you know what they gave me for a love offering $30 three days work $10 a day <laughs> Stayed in a member's home to give me $30 for a love offering. Now, again, am I complaining about that? No. But what I'm saying is, you can always tell those who take their duty seriously yeah. and those who do not. You know, if, if they had taken their duty seriously, they might have at least been able to say to me, Brother, we felt, I mean, we're small, we don't have a lot of money, but we felt like it would be an insult to give you anything less than $20 a day, which would have been $60, you know. So I'm not talking about a huge amount of money, but I'm saying, but they, basically what it amounts to is they were just going to, could have cared less. They no took whatever they, yeah, took no thought to it and just whatever they took in, they took in, and that's what they were going to give me, and that's all they cared about it. That's not the way Christians ought to work. Folks, people operating with the mind of Christ ought to operate nothing in the universe like the world. And yet, sadly, I hear every day, all day, people in the Christian community talking like the world. Approaching things the same way the world approaches things. That ought not to be. We are a different people. 
we ought to have a very different way of thinking. As Christians, we ought to look at things very, very differently. We ought to approach things very, very differently. The reason so many in the Christian community are not walking in the blessing and in the divine favor of God, seriously, is because they're not even trying to do things God's way. You, you don't do things God's way, you're not going to experience God's blessing. And it is not, I am not sitting here saying that, well, bless God, God's in heaven saying, well, you're not doing it the way I told you to do it, so I'm not going to do anything for you. No, I'm not talking about punitive actions. I'm not talking about God punishing us. I am talking about God has set in spiritual terms certain laws and principles into motion. Just like in the natural world. It's no different in the spiritual world. Uh, you know, you throw something up, it's going to come down. Unless it's a helium balloon. But you throw something up, it's going to come Why? Because there's a law at play. The law of gravity. You know what I'm talking about? So there are laws. And this is why the Word of God teaches us certain principles. And many of the spiritual laws are mirrored to natural laws. That's why the word of God said, Be not deceived, God is not mocked, for whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Yeah. And the word of God talks about, and this is something I think we, we a lot of times, we don't pay a lot of attention to. They that sow sparingly shall reap sparingly. Hello now. If you only put three seeds in the ground, don't expect more than three plants at best. But we got people who think, well, I can throw two dollars in the offering plate every month, and I'll expect God to come through for me, boy. Hallelujah, glory to God. It ain't about God coming through for you. God isn't doing nothing for you. And I, again, I want you to understand what I'm saying because a lot of preachers preach it like God is punishing you because you're not doing what. Right. No, God, it's not about God doing anything for you. God has set certain laws into motion and he says, listen, if you believe me and you trust me, I'm telling you in my word how this works. Mm -hmm. yeah. And if you have faith and you believe yeah. me, yeah. then you are yeah. going to listen to what I'm yeah. telling you and you're going to yeah. do it the way I'm showing you and it'll work. Yeah, it will. But if you don't believe me and you don't act upon what I've told you how things work, then it isn't going to happen. And it has nothing to do with whether I've done anything or not. God doesn't have to hit the planet Earth every once in a while to keep it spinning. That's right. Okay, now, God don't have to sit there and like a basketball on his finger, you know, keep it spinning. No, he has set the laws in motion. The earth is going to spin on its axis. It doesn't need any help from God. He has set it in motion. That law is at work. Do you follow what I'm yeah. saying? The same thing is true of spiritual principles. It's not about how many times I've heard people act like God is doing something good or bad to them based on their faith and confidence and obedience to something in the Word of God, or their lack of faith, lack of confidence, and lack of obedience to something in the Word of God. And they'll act like, well, God is personally doing something to me. God is personally, you know, He, he personally is making sure I'm not blessed. Because, no, He is not. <laughs> that law is in motion. If you will listen to what he's told you, he's trying to tell you how it works. Yes, he does. If you will do it, yes. you will see yes. that he knows what he's talking about. Yes. He created the principle. He created the law. He set the law in motion. I told Tommy, and I've told you all this before. I told Tommy years ago, we've been here in Dallas now 13 and a half years. All right? The first several years, the first maybe three years, he didn't tithe. That doesn't mean he didn't give, but he did not tithe. A lot of times, this church rested on his shoulders. 
I went through four years where I was without any income. And if it wasn't for Tommy paying, we wouldn't have had a church. But I'm going to tell you, I said to him one day, I, you talk about having to have faith. People don't give me credit. I had to have faith to say what I told him. I said, if you will tithe, that's all you'll have to give. See, he was given a whole lot more than his tithe to keep the church afloat all the time. I said, but you know what? If you'll just tithe, that's all you'll have to give. I will not ask anything more of you. God does not ask anything more of you. But if you will tithe, I will have a specific budget to work with. And I then will be able to try to keep us within budget. Yeah. See? And I said, and God will bless you because that is his law yeah. that he established. I didn't establish. He established it. Yeah. I said, if you'll tithe, you watch and see if God doesn't bless you. And you watch and see if the church isn't able to get along better. Because at least when you have tithers, you have a budget. You kind of have some framework. You know, you, you have some idea of how much you're bringing in each month. You know what I'm saying? And uh, so anyway, so he decided he was going to start tithing. I want to tell you, you should see the blessing of God that was unleashed in his life. You should see the blessing of God. I, that house we live in. I just told the Lord yesterday. I was taking the dogs out yesterday. And I said, Lord, thank you for this house. I'm still grateful every day for that house. Oh, yeah. I walk through that place sometimes and I think, I never dreamed in a billion years that my name would be on the title of a house like this. I never dreamed in a million years. I never dreamed that we'd ever live in such a view. And I think about when we first went there, brother, to look at it, you know, and how beautiful it was. And I think to myself, Lord have mercy. We looked at it and we just thought, oh, wow, wouldn't this be wonderful? Wouldn't this be great? But it's way beyond us. It's way beyond our women, this and that. Thing. And we were just sure that we were dreaming and we were still looking for another house. We were still shopping because we never for a minute thought we'd be in that house. Yeah. But see how God blessed us. I'm going to tell you something. That blessing did not come out of the sky. That blessing came because he and I both have been very liberal in our giving. We have sown an awful lot of seed. Not only financially, because if anybody tells you the only seed you got to sow is finances, they're lying to you. Mm -hmm. yeah. We have sown seed by way of so much effort, so much energy, putting in so much time in the work of the gospel. And God blessed us yes, he for all that seed we had sown. Yes, he has. And so that's how I see. That's you how I pour it. Is it going? Yeah, it went off early. Oh, Jesus. I have a duty to support those who are bringing the Word of God into my life, who are helping me. Now listen, if somebody just preaching from the Bible and it's not doing anything for you, mm -hmm. first of all, I don't know what you're doing wasting your time watching it. But you don't owe them anything. Am I telling the truth? You don't owe them anything. Just because somebody get up there and preach doesn't mean that you know you owe every preacher that preaches, okay? But when you are regularly benefiting from somebody's work and somebody's effort and somebody's ministry and somebody's blood, sweat, tears, and finances, it is your duty. 
to respond by supporting them. Verse 28, when therefore I have performed this and have sealed to them this fruit, I will come by you into Spain. So Paul, in a nutshell, is saying very simply, once I've delivered this offering to the poor saints in Jerusalem, I plan on getting on a boat and headed up towards Spain, and I will be coming through Rome at that time. In verse 29, he said, And I am sure that when I come unto you, I shall come in the fullness of the blessing of the gospel of Christ. You know, there is nothing like being a blessing to obtain a blessing. Paul's saying something here. This is another one of those, those spiritual principles. Paul is saying something here that is so true. And I talk about this all the time when I talk about doing the nursing home service. Every Sunday, and I'm literally getting goosebumps just thinking about it. Every Sunday, I leave the nursing home blessed. Yeah. And come to our church blessed. Yeah. If I didn't do the nursing home service first, I would not be coming with that blessing. Mm -hmm. Right. But when you are a blessing, you receive a blessing. And Paul is saying that, listen now, that's what Paul is saying to the Romans. He said, I'm bringing this offering to the poor saints at Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. He said, and I'm sure that once I've been a blessing to them, I'll wind up coming to you being all blessed. <laughs> you understand? That's what he's saying. He said, I'm going to show up in, in Rome just full of the blessing of God because I am coming from just having been a blessing. Oh, my Lord, isn't that wonderful? That's one of those spiritual principles. You know, we had a banner in our outreach center that said the way to blessing is to be a blessing. You want to, you know, my grandfather was one of the most generous giving men I've ever seen. And I thank God every day for his example. I thank God every day. I don't think anybody in this planet could honestly accuse me. Now, I might be wrong. I don't think anybody could accuse me of being a selfish person. I don't think anybody could accuse me of being a tight-fisted person. If I've got it, I'm more than happy to share it. If I've got it, I'm more than happy to do for you. Because, listen, that spiritual principle is not some far off in the boondocks notion to me. No, it is as real to me as anything. I've said to Tommy at times, I'll say, well, you know, we're going to have to pay this, or we might have to buy so-and-so a meal this week, or we might, well... I've only I've barely got enough money to get us through the week this week, and uh, you know, well, and, and and I'll say, the Lord will take care of it. Don't you sweat it for a minute. We're not talking about just going out and buying stuff we don't need. We're not talking about going out and buying a big screen TV when we don't need a big screen TV and saying, oh well, God will take care of it. Oh, that's what my mother does. I'm talking about what I do. Okay, if, if it's a matter of meeting a need and helping somebody in the church and helping one of God's people, I know God is going to take care of us. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's right. We have a situation, and y'all probably heard me tell the story in the past. We have a situation where a young lady came to our meeting when we were meeting in Oak Lawn, and she parked her car. We were at the, the community center over there. And she parked her car there in Oak Lawn and somebody bashed out her window and stole stuff out of the seat of her car. She had a little Mustang. Uh, it might have been after church while we were at Zinni's, yeah. Well, I felt so horrible and I said, oh God, please don't let this young lady decide she don't want to come back to church all because 
of some thief, you know, busting into her car. So I called her at work, or on her cell phone, she was at work, and I said, honey, where is your car right now? She said, well, I'm at work, it's here at work with me. And uh, she said, I put some plastic over the window and taped it and all that, you know. And I said, I am calling Safe Light Auto or whoever it was. I said, they're going to come and replace that glass. I've already paid for it. Now, brother, it was literally $165. It was not cheap. I've replaced glass a little bit cheaper than that. But her particular window, it was for a Mustang. Yeah. And it was not cheap, okay? I said, all they need is an address, and they will come to your job, and they'll do it while you're uh, in working. You know, I said, you don't have to do nothing. You don't have to pay them nothing. You don't have to do nothing. Oh, she was very grateful. I went ahead and paid for that. I'm going to tell you, if you think I paid for that, and I had all kind of abundance, and I'm so rich, I could not afford to do it. I did it because I wanted to be a testimony to her. I wanted to encourage her. I did not want her to be discouraged because of the actions of a thief, you know. Well, so got that done. And do you not know that our water heater at our first house went bad and we found out we needed to replace that water heater? And I said, oh, dear God, have mercy, Jesus. And the estimate we got was like $1,200 or $1,300 oh to replace the water heater. I said, Lord, I don't know what I'm going to do. All of a sudden, Claude sent Tommy and I $1,300 and said, go get your new water heater. I got a six, seven fold return on that $165. I'm going to tell you folks, if people would start taking God seriously, if people would start understanding that the principles that God has put in place are as real, they work, they work. If you do it God's way, it'll work. That's right. And, you know, I, I spend, as a preacher of the gospel, I spend so much of my life trying to convince people that God knows what he's talking about. Oh, yeah. Why I have to go to all the effort to, to, tell, to explain to people that God knows what he's talking about, I don't, I don't know. But without fail, I'm constantly trying to explain to people. God knows what he's talking about. Trust me, if you will step out in faith and take God's... You know, you're not stepping out in faith. Listen to me now. Here, you've got to understand this principle. You're not stepping out in faith believing God's going to do anything. It's not about believing God's going to do anything. It's about believing what God has said. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. I will never leave you. In the garden, <laughs> Lucifer said, What That's has God. the Lord said? <laughs> what has he has the Lord said what now? What was he trying to do? He was trying to get them to question what God had said. Because there if he could get them to question what God had said, he could get them to act against what God had said. Yeah. Most Christians today question what God has said, which is the opposite of faith. Right. And therefore, their actions are based on their doubting God. Doubting God. And then they wonder why they're not walking in the blessing. They wonder why they're not experiencing the blessing. Because the spiritual law that God has put in place and told you how it works. Here's how it works. Give and it shall be given unto you. Pressed down, shaken together, running over, shall men give unto your bosom. Mm -hmm. And now I'm going to paraphrase. Because the same way you give is the same way you learn to sin. The same level by which you give is the same level by which you will receive. The same volume that you give is the same volume by which you shall receive. My grandfather was one of the most giving people I've ever seen in my life. And I never saw anybody that received like he received. 
If you do it God's way, the way God has prescribed it, I've got news for you, sweetie. It's going to work. Every word of it's going to work. So not only was my grandfather the biggest giver I ever saw, he was also the biggest receiver I ever saw. Every time you turned around, somebody was giving him something. Give, and it shall be given unto you. Press down, shaking together, running over, shall men give unto your bosom. My grandfather gave away one rototiller, and a man drove up to his house in a pickup truck and gave him four. Literally, literally. He had his own little business uh, where he was just working on small engines and stuff you know this guy brought him it was either three or four rototillers said don they work they all work he said but i have no need of them and i figure since you got your own little thing going here maybe you can do some oh, he had just given away one and he turned around and got a return of at least triple okay so folks i'm trying to tell you it works Oh, wow. The reason most people don't know it works is because they've never really tried it. That's true. And the other problem is people want to sow seed today and then they want to pick fruit tomorrow. Mm -hmm. I got a family member who's famous for that. Why, well, bless God, if God don't dump $10,000 in her banking account tomorrow because she tithes today then tithing doesn't really work. Um, have you ever planted a seed and see it come up the next day? No. I've seen seeds come up in a few days. Yeah. I've never seen it come up the next day. But you know, people don't understand. Again, this is about spiritual principles. You sow your seed, then it's up to conditions that exist as to whether or not you're going to reap and let me tell you the word of God says for instance I don't know why I'm going off on this tangent but that's alright it's all good <laughs> but uh, you've got to water that seed but you know what a lot of people do instead of watering their seed they poison it there's a reason the word of God said God loveth a cheerful giver there's a reason the word of God says not to give out of necessity. Why do you not give out of necessity? I'll tell you why. Because when you give out of necessity, you're going to be anxious. And that anxiety may wind up giving birth to things coming out of your mouth. Life and death are in the power of the tongue. Have you ever heard folks talk about talk to your plants? Mm -hmm. Yeah. They claim plants thrive yes. when you talk to them. Well, when you plant your seed, if you're sitting there saying, See, I knew God was just going to let me. I knew it wasn't going to hurt. I knew I shouldn't have given that money up. You're poisoning your seed. Guess what happens? That seed never grows. Why? Because you talked to it all day and all night and spoke death to it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. You spoke death to it. You don't do that. You've got, when you plant your seed, you've got to make sure you fertilize it. You've got to make sure that you water it. Mm -hmm. My Lord, have mercy. Lord, I gave my tithe this week and I know you're going to come through because you said you'd come through. Jesus, I trust you. God, you ain't never failed me and I know you're not going to. And I'm feeling the Holy Ghost saying this. Mm -hmm. I am. I'm covered with chills. You know, and you speak life. You speak positive things. Positive, yes. Amen. You speak life over that seed and see if that seed won't germinate. See if it won't grow. So Paul said, and I'm sure when I come unto you, I shall come in the fullness 
of the blessing of the gospel of Christ. He said, I'm going to be a blessing to the saints at Jerusalem. And I know when I come to you, I will come with the fullness of the blessing. Because you can't be a blessing without getting a blessing. That's right. In verse 30, he said, Now I beseech you, brethren, for the Lord Jesus Christ's sake, and for the love of the Spirit, that ye strive together with me in your prayers to God for me. That's a long-winded way of saying, Please join me in prayer. <laughs> That's all he's saying. Please join me in prayer. Verse 31, about what? that I may be delivered from them that do not believe in Judea, and that my service, which I have for Jerusalem, may be accepted of the saints, that I may come unto you with joy by the will of God, and may with you be refreshed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So Paul said, I need you to join me in prayer. What do I need you to join me in prayer about? Well, there are some Jews in Judea who don't believe, and they just love to cause me all kinds of grief and all kinds of trouble. And I want to be able to go to Jerusalem and be a blessing and get my blessing and come to you blessed. So that I then can bring a blessing to you. Because that's how blessing works. You know, they say one of the laws of uh, nature is that energy can neither be created nor destroyed. Right? Mm -hmm. Well, that is true of blessing. <laughs> you can't destroy it. You can only pass it on. Amen. Mm -hmm. The problem is some people, instead of passing it on to somebody else, they wind up just kind of like dissipating it up into the sky. But see, every blessing you get, you have an opportunity to take that blessing and bring it with you. I remember my grandfather one time. He used to love when Brother... Uh, Tetlock, who was a little independent Jesus name preacher that was a friend of our family for many, many years. Marvelous man of God. And my grandfather used to love to go visit him. And Brother Tetlock and his wife lived up in uh, Canada. And my grandfather was from Maine, you know. And so he would drive all, I mean, that's a long drive. He'd drive all the way up through New England, you know, up into Canada, and he'd go visit Brother Tatlock. Well, brother, you couldn't be around Brother Tatlock, but you'd feel blessed. And I know this for a fact, because I'm telling you, I, <laughs> that man was such a blessing to be around. You would feel so encouraged and so uplifted and so, you know, whoo, you'd feel so good being around him. And Grandpa would get in his car and all the way home he would be basking in that blessing oh he would just be floating you know how it is yes. when the holy ghost all upon oh, you oh, yeah yes. oh he'd bring that home with him you know he yes. just feeling god all the way home and he gets to the house and my grandmother says oh i need to run to the store don and get something do you need anything and he'd say no I'm okay. And she'd get in his car and drive it to the store. And when she got home, my grandfather would say, Did you feel it? Did you feel it? Did you feel in the car what I've been feeling all the way home? And my grandmother being the wonderful, gorgeous, marvelous, Holy Ghost filled saint of God in the Pentecostal movement for half a century without fail would say, I didn't feel anything, God. I don't know what you're talking about. And pop his balloon. I saw it happen over and over again. But I'm going to tell you something. I could get in his car after he got back from a trip. And boy, I mean to tell you, you could just feel the presence of the Lord. I know she felt it. She just loved to prick his balloon. That she just That's what she did. <laughs> Don't ask me. But you know, I'm telling you, blessing 
is something that you have the opportunity. When you pick that ball up, you can pass it on to somebody else. So Paul says, I'm going to go to Jerusalem. I'm going to be a blessing. I'm going to pick up a blessing. I hope to come back to you so that I can then pass that blessing on to you. And that same wonderful blessing that I feel from God, from having been a blessing to the saints in Jerusalem, I'm going to bring it with me, and I hope you all will be able to join with me in feeling that marvelous blessing from the Lord. That's what he's saying Amen. to the saints at Rome. Amen. He said, now pray with me, because there are those out there doing the work of the devil, and they love to steal your blessings. The thief cometh not, but for to steal, and to kill, and to destroy. And if he can steal your blessing, and get you back into a negative frame of mind, and get you back into a, you know, down and depressed, and thinking all negative, he's going to do it if he can. He don't like it when you're blessed. He doesn't like it when you're feeling the blessing of the Lord. The enemy's going to do everything in his power to steal your blessing. I'm going to tell you, I've been around people and I've told people, I said, I swear to God, I think you, you must get a paycheck from the devil. Because it almost seems sometimes like they're on the devil's payroll, Brother Jack. You know what I'm talking about. It almost feels like they're on the enemy's payroll. I swear to heavens... If there's any way they can say something stupid or do something stupid that's going to have your blessing just torn out of your hands and put you in a nasty bad mood, by God they're going to do it every time. And I hate to say it, it doesn't make me proud to say it, but I'm not kidding, my grandmother was that way. My grandmother, she could... I don't know why she, I, I, I swear sometimes I think she got her kicks, brother, out of doing it. I really do. It was almost like, let me see if I can pop your balloon. Because that woman would almost, it was like she searched her mind for what to say that would bring you down to earth so fast you'll crash and burn. She would do it to my grandfather. She would do it to me. She would do it to every child she had. She'd do it to her brothers and sisters. She would do it to everybody. She had an opportunity to do it. I've talked with various family members about it over the years. And they say, oh, I don't know why she did it. But every time. Every time. I'm going to tell you something. This is why the word of God teaches us to walk in wisdom. If somebody is walking in and with a blessing. You ought to do everything in your power to keep that ball rolling. Am I telling the truth? You ought to do everything in your power to keep that ball rolling. Okay? If you see my word, they're sure blessed their feelings. That is not the time to start griping about something. That is not the time to start going into bad news. That is not the time to start going into, you know, all this negativity and all this nastiness. If you see someone is experiencing blessing, then for God's sakes, let them enjoy that blessing. You know if it were you, you wouldn't want somebody tearing it out of your hands. But I've seen people in churches over the years. I've seen people, brother, that that was their talent. They could literally just tear a blessing out of your hand as fast as you could say hello to them. Am I telling the truth? Amen. All right. We're almost done for the week. So he said in verse 31 again that I may be delivered from them that do not believe in Judea and that my service which I have for Jerusalem may be accepted of the saints that I may come unto you with joy by the will of God and may with you be refreshed again he said that I can take that blessing I'm going to get from being a blessing bring it to you and that we can all be refreshed together 
And then he finally, in verse 33, chapter 15, he says, Now the God of peace be with you all. Amen. Amen.